And we'll, we're going to move along and move broader in terms of scale. So again, we start off at the genetic scale. We move to the physiology microbiome scale. And now we're going to add all that other stuff that constitutes a person, which is like behaviors and thoughts and uh, th that everything wrapping around the um, physiology, the microbiome and genetics. So with that, we have three uh, more speakers. Uh, so once again, they're going to give five minute presentations and we're going to have to try to have a um, uh, discussion afterwards. So you can check out their bios on the website. So I'm not going to read their bios uh, uh, thoroughly. I'm just going to mention their names and where they're from currently. So Andres Acosta is from the Mayo Clinic. Samantha Kleinberg is from the Stevens Institute of Technology. And Diana M. Thomas is from the United States Military Academy at West Point. So again, you can read your their bios on the website. So without further ado, I'm gonna take the virtual mic and pass it along to uh, Andres. Wonderful, thank you, Bruce. Uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. So I'm going to change the conversation as Bruce was mentioning into uh, phenotypes, pathophysiological and behavioral phenotypes and how they guide obesity management to enhance weight loss. So, um, uh, here's some disclosures, and particularly important for this talk is that uh, Phenomic Sciences uh, has licensed the technology from uh, the Mayo Clinic and is trying to develop a biomarker to uh, predict these obesity phenotypes that I'll be talking today, but here are my other uh, conflict of interest. So briefly introducing obesity as something we have been talking about nutrition, but not really obesity as a disease that is the focus of the outcome of a poor nutrition. We know that obesity is the number one chronic disease in the world. It affects 40% of adults. And it matters not because we look a little bit heavier, it matters because it leads to many diseases, but particularly to death. So we are dying pre more uh, premature because of obesity. It also matters because we're spending $480 billion of direct and healthcare costs in obesity. And unfortunately, in spite of existing treatments such as six FDA approved medications, five devices, and three bariatric surgeries, and every week there's a new diet that people are trying, the prevalence of obesity continues to increase and is projected by the year 2030 will have 50% of obesity in the United States. And there are many reasons to think why this might be happening, but in my opinion, the more important one is this variable in response. The one size fits all is not working. And that's why precision nutrition, precision obesity is essential. So what do we mean by the one size fits all is not working when we're trying to treat obesity? Here's an example that I'll go briefly through this with a diet, such as an example of lower carbohydrate, a medication such as liraglutide, a device such as the duodenal liner, and the gastric bypass. And the point to show this graphic is that we see a huge variability on response with all the interventions. You can see this very nice bell-shaped curve with all these interventions. And the same thing happened with this heterogeneity among the pathophysiological variables within obesity or within our energy metabolism. So here we see how many calories of patients consume before they reach fullness. We see 660 uh, patients consuming 444 calories to 2,800 calories. It's a huge variability before they reach fullness. Same thing with prospandial fullness. How full do you feel two hours after a meal? Huge range. And similar thing with emotional eating for anxiety or our resting energy expenditure. So we humans are different. And that was introduced yesterday in very nice and elaborated ways. So when we talk about obesity, our current classifications are not addressing the heterogeneity of obesity. They're telling us who is at risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. When we, particularly when we look at things like body mass index, the metabolic status of a patient, particularly with insulin resistance, or the obesity staging systems. So we need to change the way that we look at obesity. And precision medicine wants to change that concept. And when we look at precision medicine for obesity or, or any other chronic disease, we need to change the traditional approach in which phenotypes drive a disease, and then we go through large trials and try to have very variable, highly variable outcomes into the precision medicine promise, which is let's take a disease, let's break it into phenotypes, and each phenotype should have its unique pathway, its unique treatment, and have better outcomes. The question is when we talk about obesity is what are the obesity phenotypes? And obesity phenotypes can be many things, but as we were hearing from the previous talks, the genetics matter when we talk about nutrition and when we talk about obesity, but also our lifestyle matter. And it's only the combination of two that will give us the phenotype of an individual. It doesn't matter if I have the perfect genetics, if I'm not exercising and eating very poorly, I'm still going to have obesity and consume the same thing, the opposite. 
So what are the obesity phenotypes? Debatable, but here's my approach. Obesity is a disease of the energy balance where intake and expenditure needs to be in equilibrium and intake is mainly driven by hunger, satiation, satiety, and emotional eating. Expenditure on the other side is driven by rest and energy expenditure, physical activity, and exercise. And when we lose this balance, we start storing these extra calories in the way of fat, and the excess of fat brings us two problems, a deposit of toxicity and a deposit of excess. And the deposit of toxicity, for example, brings in some resistance and then diabetes and so on. So the question is, when we wanna focus on these phenotypes of obesity and not on the complications of obesity, how do we do it? So we phenotype our patients, both in the research arena, as well as in the clinic, at the Mayo Clinic. So we measure the different domains, food intake, we measure the homeostatic eating behavior, the, we meet the hedonic eating behavior, as well as energy expenditure. I hear the details of how we measure them, but let me walk you through a day when a patient comes to us in the clinic or to the research. They come after an overnight fast, we measure a body composition using a DEXA scan, then we measure indirect calorimetry using uh, or rest energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry. Then we provide a standard breakfast with a radio label isotope that we can study their gastric emptying. And we do visual animal scales for appetite, measuring hunger, satiation, satisfaction, and desire to eat. And then four hours later, we provide a, a liberal meal. So we measure how many calories someone consumed before they feel full. And then we follow them for two more hours. While we're doing all these, we also measure many questionnaires. We provide podometers to our patients so we can measure their number of steps as well as record their physical activity. So we published this uh, initial publication in gastroenterology in 2015, and then using a machine learning after measuring all these variables, we came up with four obesity phenotypes. The first one is hungry brain, where patients eat more than um, what normal people should eat in one meal. They have an abnormal satiation that usually goes for seconds and thirds. The problem is in the brain, so we're walking away from the term satiation, and we're telling that the problem is in the brain, so we call it hungry brain. On the contrary, the second group is folks with hungry gut. Their problem is abnormal prostrandial satiety. They feel full, uh, normal, and then suddenly they start feeling hungry sooner. Then the third group is emotional hunger, people eating for their emotions. And the last group is folks who have abnormal metabolism. Well, we took this outside of the uh, machine learning box or the black box and measured the distribution in 450 new patients different uh, um, uh, patients with different characteristics. And we can see in these Venn diagrams that patients have one or more uh, obesity phenotypes with 27% of patients who are having two or more obesity phenotypes and 15% of patients don't have any of these phenotypes. So why all these matters? And very briefly, I'm just going to mention about this. We've completed multiple proof of concept trials showing that in randomized placebo controlled trials, phenotypes can help us enhance weight loss with obesity. And I invite you all to read these trials the first one with fentanyl to pyramid extended release, then with exenatide, liraglutide, or bare intracastric balloon, endoscopic and lipid gastroplasty, a spiral cyst device, and a spats intracastric balloon. We also have two real world experiences. The first one with intracastric balloon that was published last year. And this year we published that phenotype guided pharmacotherapy in the clinical practice can double the amount of weight loss compared to a standard use of pharmacotherapy. So to conclude, we're working into understanding how phenotype can actually uh, uh, help us understand the deep phenotype of each of these individuals. We'll use the bio biomarkers using multiomics to try to predict them as well as to understand what's the underlying cause. And hopefully this, this could be useful as a companion diagnosis and have better outcomes when we want to treat obesity. So as a takeaway, we know that in chronic complex diseases such as obesity, the one treatment fits all is not working. Obesity is a complex disease with many phenotypes, but phenotype guided intervention doubles the amount of weight loss and in the future, phenotypes can be measured with a simple blood test. Thank you and happy to the discussion in the future, in the next few minutes. Um, I'm Samantha, I'm gonna change gears a little bit. Um, I'm also not entrepreneurial enough and have no disclosures. Um, so we've heard a lot about tracking things other than diet and looking at their impact on health. We can all go out and buy Apple Watch or Fitbit and track our steps. You can buy sensors to track stress. We can track sleep. Um, and none of these sensors are perfect, but they can all function without our input, right? And so we can get some insight into what we're doing each day, um, but still the ways we track diet look more like this, right? And so even if we're using, you know, apps developed specifically for studies, um, taking photos of our food, it still requires active input on the participants part um, or us as consumers, right? We have to actually make that choice. We have to remember to track our meal um, we have to remember what we ate yesterday or the day before for filling out a food frequency questionnaire, which can be really hard. 
Um, and also it makes it impossible to get real-time guidance, right? So if you're a person who has type one diabetes um, and uses an artificial pancreas system or manages your diabetes yourself and wants insulin guidance, um, you have to figure out what you're eating, how much is in the meal, and then an app can tell you potentially how much insulin you need, um, but it can't make those determinations on its own, which is a major barrier to, in one um, respect, a fully automated um, insulin delivery system, as well as for people who don't have diabetes, um, feedback on our diet throughout the day. And so for the last few years, I've been working on developing technologies to track meals uh, the same way that we track step count. And so I use this um, equivalence because the goal isn't going to be to track meals perfectly. Um, we're never going to be able to figure out automatically that you added, you know, butter to that sweet potato or that you cooked something in oil versus, you know, coconut oil versus olive oil, um, or figure out, you know, what's in your coffee when you can add lots of different types of sweeteners or milks. Um, but people also aren't very good at tracking their meals. And so the hope is if we can overall be roughly as good as humans are, um, that would be a really valuable contribution. So there's actually been quite a lot of work on tracking meal timing um, using a range of different sensors. So audio sensors like, um, you know, earbuds that track chewing sounds, um, motion sensors, including uh, Google Glass, so measuring head motion, uh, wrist motion, so looking at when you deliver food or drink to your mouth, um, image sensors, either worn on the body and taking images continuously, um, or mobile apps where you take a photo of the meal. Um, I've done some work with multimodal sensors, so combining audio and motion sensing. Um, but all these have the same limitation that if you have one sensor, you know, audio might not be the best sensor for picking up on soft foods, motion might miss other things. Um, and only knowing meal times isn't really enough for the kinds of work you want to do and certainly for the kinds of personalized, um, you know, guidance uh, for nutrition that we're interested in. So moving on, can we figure out what people are eating, not just if they're having a meal or not? And so there has been some work on this. Um, until recently, most of it's been in the lab, um, looking at individual sensors. And so for example, using audio sensors to get chewing sounds, um, motion, again, images. Um, but these are with relatively small sets of foods and really uh, discrete foods. So looking at you know, potato chips or you know, carrots or something like that versus full meals. Um, and so my lab has shown that actually if we combine multiple sensors, so head-mounted motion sensors, um, earbuds with microphones, um, wrist sensors for wrist motion, you actually don't necessarily need all of those. As long as you have one motion sensor and one audio sensor, it's okay. Um, and combining data from both free living and laboratory environments. Um, and so we actually use both for our training and for our testing. Um, so in the lab, we can label every chew, every swallow, and we do. Um, in free living environments, we don't follow people around with cameras, and so we don't have that ground truth. Um, we have much coarser ground truth, but we have much wider variety of behavior where people go to restaurants, have picnics, they eat their family and their friends. Um, and so we get a much broader view of diet and nutrition. And combining those, we're actually able to identify food type in an automated way. Um, so our first study looked only at lab data where we had about 83% accuracy. And this is looking at each individual bite. And so is this bite steak? Is it a potato? Is it a salad? Um, you know, we might get one bite wrong or another bite right in a meal, but we tried to evaluate and be a little bit hard on ourselves. Um, in free living environments, we have a hierarchical approach. And so we can figure out maybe our classifier is less confident, but we know someone's eating meat, even if we can't identify the exact meat. Um, in other cases, we might be able to identify that they're consuming pork versus chicken. Um, and there we had uh, similar accuracy in totally unconstrained environments with unconstrained meals. Um, and using the free living data also improved our accuracy on lab data. Um, however, there are still major gaps. Um, so we don't know anything about why people are choosing to eat, hunger, fullness, why they chose the specific foods they're interested in, um, social context, emotional context, um, you know, all of those other, other things that factor into food choices. Um, but the other major uh, limitation um, in the context of this meeting is generalizability. And so we do have a huge variety of food. And so we had roughly 40 or 50 different foods here. Um, and even salad, every salad looks a little bit different. 
Um, however, everyone was American and eating a roughly, you know, similar American diet. Um, and we know nothing really about generalizability to other cultures, other food types. Um, the positive is that within 40 or 50 different foods, we can classify intake very reliably. Um, on the other hand, your 40 or 50 foods might be totally different from mine, and it might be totally different from people in another country or culture. Um, and we need vastly more data than we currently have to address those problems. So I'll stop there. Um, and this is obviously a very collaborative enterprise with lots of different people and funding from a lot of different agencies. Hi, I'm Diana Thomas. Um, and I think I'm gonna piggyback right off of Samantha's talk. So um, we still ask questions by surveys um, predominantly to find out what participants and patients are thinking in nutrition. So I'm gonna give everybody an exercise. Let's see. Um, my conflicts of interest, I don't have any um, and uh, I don't represent the army. <laughs> um, so the exercise I'm gonna give you is to look at these two letters of recommendation. One of the letters was from uh, for a cadet who is now separated from the academy for misconduct. And the other one is for a cadet who is now in leadership. Um, and so if you look at these two letters, they have, they both sound positive, but can you look at them closely and decide which letter was tagged to the cadet who was separated for misconduct and which letter went for the cadet who's now in leadership. So I'll, I'll give just a few seconds because I only have a few minutes total, but uh, to look at this and make a decision and hold that decision. Um, uh, at the end of my presentation, we'll come back to this and I'll, I'll tell you what in these letters were red flags that identified which cadet is um, at risk for separation? While you're looking at that, you might be wondering why is she talking about letters of recommendation um, in a talk on precision nutrition? It is because I wanna convince you of the rich amount of data that we get from the written word and how we can look at the written words of, of a participant and see what they're thinking. Really, we already do this. So these are an example of two different uh, surveys that we use in nutrition. The top box is a question that comes out of the um, International Physical Activity Questionnaire. And the bottom one is a, the first question on the Food Frequency Questionnaire used by N. Haynes. So we do ask participants, as Samantha mentioned earlier, um, and they're usually not free form tax responses. We ask questions in multiple choice uh, or Likert type style questions so where we have a graded strongly agree down to strongly disagree. And there's two reasons why we don't ask for written responses. One is because we feel that getting data in the form of multiple choice answers may be easier to analyze. The second reason is that it might be overwhelming to get 10,000 written responses from people and try to analyze that manually. Um, on the first case, as a statistician, I can tell you that um, it is not easier to look at multiple choice responses or categorical responses. It's actually extremely hard to make statistical inferences from that kind of data. And the second case with R and Python and the packages we have available, we can automate looking at written responses and get a wealth of information about what participants are thinking. So I'm gonna share with you one example. Uh, in this particular example, uh, this was a survey that was administered by the Obesity Action Coalition. It was a weight bias survey that was administered in over a thousand participants, but the number actually doesn't matter. This is pretty small of a sample. We just dealt with 38,000 public comments for the dietary guidelines and it, it was, uh, the analysis was run pretty quickly. So in the survey, there were 26 total questions. Most of them were Likert type questions. And um, the other, there was one free text response question. In your opinion, what does uh, the American public think about people with obesity? So there's lots of really cool things that you can do with the free form text. But one of the first things we always do is we look at sentiment. And uh, how this works is that 
R and Python have packages, uh, their dictionaries that assign sentiment to different words. So a word like happy would get a positive number because it's a happy positive word. And a word like lazy might be assigned a negative sentiment score. And uh, there's also dictionaries that classify words into emotions. So for example, um, there's eight emotions here that are picked up by this dictionary. And what you can see from the freeform text response in general, um, that people responded with words that fall into the classification of disgust. So what does as a group that those participants think uh, about what the public thinks about people with obesity, they responded with disgust. And on the sentiment side, you can see that the language that was used in that free form response was mostly negative. So you can see that it skews, the distribution skews more to the negative side. I'm not advocating for getting rid of Likert. We actually have found that if you ask a Likert question and follow that up with a free form text response question that's linked to that Likert question, you get the most bang for your buck. We didn't have the luxury with this survey because this survey was already collected uh, and administered before we got to the analysis. We were brought in after the fact. But we did take the sentiment that you saw on the freeform text response and then con concatenate that back to the liquor, one of the liquor questions. And we found this one really fascinating. So on uh, one of the liquor questions, participants were asked to classify their own weight status or the perception of their own weight status. And we uh, overlaid the sentiment on, on top of the, um, the answers of whether they classified them as very underweight somewhat underweight and so forth. And what you can see is as the person's, um, as the respondent's weight status increases, the sentiment becomes more negative. There's more negative response. And these are notch plots with medians. So you can see the median is going down, which gives you so much more insight than what we had seen just from the Likert question alone. We see that probably people had more sec felt more negative sentiment if their weight status was higher because they might be on the receiving end of bias. That's some in the discussion part of a paper, you'd make that kind of analysis. So it's not something that you'd exactly get from the data. So I'm gonna finish up with this, um, this interesting um, letters of recommendation. Um, so the, if you chose the green, the answer is correct. Um, the green was the cadet that was separated. And the flags that we picked up, we looked at 10,000, cadet applications with three letters of recommendation in each one of them. And what we picked up was that um, language that was focused on the future or the present were a predictor of poor performance. And so if you look at the green, the language is a little bit more to the future. Um, he will, or I, have, I know he will do this, or they were fo focused on the present. Whereas this red letter, was focused, had a focus on the past. If the language is focused on the past, that was associated with better performance. So you can see over here, improved award, he won, he earned. And so these were, um, and you can think about why uh, as just uh, thinking about why that would be the case, but um, th those were associated as predictors of better performance. And with that, I will close and hand the baton off to Bruce. Right. Thank you, Diana. It's always good to get a reading assignment during a presentation. <laughs> um, it's interesting whenever you present a reading assignment, you immediately uh, get your uh, uh, guard up and say, okay, I'm going to do this well, do this well. So thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, um, uh, Samantha and Diana for uh, some great presentations and really to get our discussion started. So um, one of the things that the common themes, I think, through the three talks that you had is showing how complex uh, these different processes and mechanisms are. So Samantha showed that, well, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out what people are, are trying to eat so you can use these different types of sensors. Diana, you talked about the complexity of uh, words being linked together. And Andres, you, you talked about the complexity of, um, uh, you know, the different phenotypes uh, for obesity. Um, and the fact that now you have these different types of uh, computer techniques and approaches that can tease out these different types of complexities. Of course, one of the challenges with complexities is that you go the wrong direction and you 
then start classifying people in in ways that you shouldn't be classifying them. Again, we're going back to uh, bias and and the issues of diversity, inclusion, et cetera. So, so how do we how do we tackle that? And how do you? I mean, it's a whole. It's a, it can be a jungle out there. So, how does a consumer or someone else tell you know separate these things out? And, and you know, it's it's the whole process of describing complexity. So, wanted to see if you have any thoughts about that. Um. I'll start. Um, that's a great question, Bruce. And I think um, <clears throat> so. There's too many ways to look at this when we're gathering, you know, thousands of and, and hundred thousands and millions of data endpoints. Is um, first we need to be open-minded. First, we as scientists and physicians or providers, but then we need to do a lot of unsupervised work that needs to be validated in clinical trials. And uh, not because when we start applying these novel techniques like machine learning and we're doing supervised analysis. Uh, guide us to a certain point, then we need to bring what I call human intelligence and say, well, does this make sense? Can, this, can I translate this for to a patient in front of me or, or, or to uh, a consumer? And then eventually test those things. So unsupervised, make sure it makes sense, and then uh, test it in a, probably a, hopefully a randomized placebo control trial or a randomized trial. I was going to say the same thing. I feel like there's a lot of both art and science um, and looking at the food types. I mean, we're trying, to, our focus is figuring out, you know, what you're eating in every bite. And you could think of it at the level of if you eat a salad, we could try to figure out, you know, every component of the salad um, that quickly becomes intractable, um, as realized. Um, and so, you know, we came up with the idea of thinking of foods in a hierarchy. And so, you know, when we're uncertain, we can be more coarse and just try to figure out, you know, is it a carb, is it a protein, is it a vegetable, um, and then be more specific when, you know, we're, we're more clear. But of course, like that hierarchy is an artifact, right? That, does, that doesn't actually exist in the world. We've imposed that on these foods and that's going to look totally different in other places and for other people. Um, and there's just no like fact of it or ground truth. And so that's something that we continually struggle with, right? Whereas if we use, you know, food databases, um, then we're back to having, you know, this huge universe of foods. And so I think the ultimate solution will probably be you have, you know, more specialized versions that are tailored for, you know, people with different diets. So I'll, I'll think I'm adding to what uh, everyone else is saying and um, that there's, it's not like pushing a button on SPSS and having it just spit out for you the graphs. I don't think we've ever been able to do that with any one of these methods that, you know, machine learning methods that we've used. Um, so with the NLP, what is the, a back, uh, a, I think a, a limitation is that the sentiment dictionaries are made by humans and humans decided that those words were positive or negative. So we've always had to go and dig into the data and look at some of the results individually and ask ourselves, does this make sense? Um, you can't just uh, rely on the machine learning method to tell you uh, for sure what's going on. And this is the same thing that was just said by Andres and uh, Samantha. But um, what we found uh, in one of the cases was um, there was a weight, uh, weight study, weight loss study during COVID. And we peeled out one of, the, one of the participants' messages that came out extremely positive. And they were talking about how the food was around them all the time and they couldn't keep their hands off the food. And clearly the sentence was a negative sentence because it was a weight loss study that was ongoing during COVID. And so um, we talked about how to uh, modify the dictionary and validate the dictionary um, using training and testing methods, uh, that, which is reserved for neural networks. But we were thinking about doing it in NLP to mitigate this bias. So yeah, you have to think more than just push a button. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, about a decade ago where uh, there, I saw analysis where people were an, an, uh, analyzing social media messages for you know, uh, flu um, prevalence or flu instance. And they realized that a lot of people were using the word uh, sick, but it was that's sick in their messages. So it was the, sort of the opposite. So they, were, they started off counting um, some of those messages that had nothing to do with the flu. Um, Samantha, a, a, a question emerged from the audience about how specific um, do, do we need to know or understand diets? Uh, you know, can we just leave to, you know, categorizing foods in general areas, or do we really want to know specifically uh, what's being eaten? What's the benefit of that? 
So I think it depends completely on what your application is, right? The good vision. So for example, if someone's trying to, you know, understand food sensitivities or potentially food allergies, right now it's really difficult and time consuming to do elimination diets and things like that, right? Whereas if you could track symptoms and then we could track your foods, maybe you could find those relationships. But there you want to have specific food, you know, foods in there. Um, for insulin dosing, you know, macronutrients do matter. It's not just carbs, right? Fat and protein also affect what your glycemic response is going to be. And we've seen there's a lot more to it than just fat and protein. Um, but maybe you could say, I'm only interested in the level of, you know, macronutrients, or maybe, you know, for your fitness goals, you're interested in how much protein you're consuming. Um, it's also interesting to think about in terms of the sensors we use. So for the highest accuracy, we found you need a combination of audio and motion. And so audio can tell you, you know, at the high level categories of protein and vegetables and the motion gives you those more specific categories. But if you're only interested in maybe high level information and you only want to wear one sensor, then you can make that trade off, right? Um, but so again, it's going to just depend on what you're trying to do with the information. And um, Andres, I got it. we got a question from the audience that uh, wanted you to elaborate on the four reasons related to overeating and the differences in approach to help with weight loss. Yeah, so we came up with these four main phenotypes uh, in a way to try to classify patients based on their pathophysiological and behavioral phenotypes. Um, so are they the four reasons why people gain weight? Maybe, could be a chicken or the egg. For example, if we never feel full, um, are we always eating more or we, because we have obesity, we're eating more to compensate for those calories? I think that research needs to be uh, made. So uh, um, I think it's important to, um, to understand that these studies to be done in a prospective and long-term manner to, uh, as we were discussed yesterday, in order to understand whether these are cause or consequences of obesity. However, if we measure at one point and we start using them to manage obesity, I think based on our uh, publications that we can start tailoring the uh, management of obesity, particularly at the level of medications and devices, and more work needs to be done at the level of diet and surgery in order to try to tailor the approach for patients with obesity and help uh, providers and patients select what's the best intervention for them. Our current work and data is supportive of this uh, phenotype guided intervention. And I want to be the first one to acknowledge there might be more phenotypes that are important to include. There might be less phenotypes that we might have to include. The matter of the fact is that we need to start stratifying chronic complex diseases such as obesity and help find the right intervention for the right patient. Thanks, Andres. So we have, uh, let's see, about uh, a couple minutes before we have to move, well, actually a little less than a couple minutes before I have to move on to the next panel. Uh, so maybe you could give us a sense of like where, um, this uh, monitoring of the individual and then analyzing the data is going? Like, what are some of the next steps? How do you see uh, uh, wearables and monitoring devices? Where do you see um, uh, natural language processing and analysis of, of uh, words and text going? Um, what, what are your thoughts, Samantha, Diana? <laughs> So for me, I'd say a lot of work is still, you know, in the research publication stage, right? And there's not, you know, commercially available devices, um, but there's been so much progress in the last five years. I would think in the next five years, it's devices that you can actually buy that, you know, are going to have limitations, but that are scaled down, um, you know, and reasonable in terms of cost. So we're targeting earbuds that would cost maybe $50 to build. Um, that would be the goal if you would have, you know, audio and motion all in one, um, and we'll be able to use that for, for tracking your food. Um, on the research side, I hope that the where it's going is large scale studies with diverse populations, um, but depends on funding and all those usual things. I would um, add to Samantha's that um, putting some of the things that we already know together. So the sensors with written words, with even the self-report from the past, there was um, a, a study that was uh, conducted where they used self-report and the bite counter together um, with a mathematical model, all three, and that proved to be the best way to, the best adherence came from that group. And so putting all the things that we know together to 
um, facilitate behavior change or to analyze data, analyze things would be, I think, valuable. So I will add uh, very briefly that um, I think what we are doing um, at the academic level that in the companies that has been spin out from academic centers such as you know day two and SOWI as well as bioma we just heard but also the nih initiatives of precision nutrition i think what the common theme that we're hearing and i think is very important is that when we're dealing with these complex conditions and understanding nutrition we need to think very wide open the network and collect as much data as we can in the most systematic way so then we can really try to make sense of the data and let the data tell, tell us what to do